started. I watched that Kansas Kansas State game last week. And I don't want to take anybody off. I've seen you're pretty big. Are you going to throw any chairs at me or anything? I don't care who won. You don't care who won? So I want to kind of be honest with you here. I call this four years of mistakes. So I'm not that seasoned farmer. Now I grew up on the farm, uh, but I did have a different kind of plan in mind when I got out of school. I, I went to the city and, and tried my way with that. So I came back to the farm in 2010, and I started working with this relay cropping, poly cropping stuff here in the last four or five years. So my presentation is basically just sharing with you my mistakes and what I've learned along the way and kind of the projects I'm working on. And uh, I want to finish up somewhat soon so I can take on questions from the audience. That's what I really enjoy for kind of selfish reasons. So as I said before, as I got out of school, I really, I, I had to get cleaned up and wear a suit and tie, and I just really didn't like that life. So I started a landscape business, and I did that for about six or seven years. So when I came to the farm, it just didn't make much sense that we were just raising one crop. This is just our farm sign here three or four years ago. And what I would see, or what I would do, is provide landscape services, but I would install these living billboards. So this would be an example of a living billboard, where we try to get a nice curb appeal for a business, and then this was kind of my calling card. Instead of spending money in the phone book or billboards or all that kind of stuff, spending money, if I would just make a property look really good, it seemed to, seemed to work and give me drive business up. So, you see this is probably uh, late September. You've got four different plants here, but there's probably at least 10 plants were planted in this planter box over the course of the year to wake up early. So we had daffodils and tulips up front with pansies, and then I came in here and plucked these petunias in here. Uh, we've got salvias, two different salvias, and then those canvas bulbs in the back. So you have to be cognizant of the shape and size and when the things bloomed, and, and providing different colors is how you kind of differentiated yourself. And also there's a lot of value in these little niches that are little things you figure out through time. If I plant these petunias in between my daffodils, it could be 26, 27 degrees and it wouldn't kill that summer annual. I could use that as kind of protection, but also I could buy 64 of them for seven or eight dollars from the wholesaler and plant a big area like this for 10 or 15 dollars instead of waiting six weeks later, spending more money on bigger flowers, and now I get bigger root depth and, and I would save me time and money later on. So again, I came to the farm and the first thing I started doing is wheat and soybeans, and, and I was selling for a, a little regional company called Broadbeck Seeds, and they were coming out with Enlist Soybeans. And this is, again, five years ago, and I thought, man, this would be pretty easy. There's a herbicide synergy in place. I can use old wheat herbicides on the soybeans. So I started messing around with that. So I want to play you this video real quick here. So I get into this, and I read the audience, and they start wondering, how in the heck do you pull this off? And I didn't really know myself. Uh, this is my field day. Uh, and what I did was I invited everyone to come watch me harvest live. Now, to be honest, I was scared, really scared that this was going to be a complete disaster because I changed the system here to 60-inch rows, and my soybeans were now a foot, foot and a half taller than the wheat. So a company in Canada called FlexiFinger designed these little paddles here to push those soybeans down. And the previous week, I would go out there with these paddles, and I could bend that soybean down. And I thought, eh, maybe, I don't know. But as I really pushed them down, I was starting to break off some of them. So we just, so we just did it. <laughs> At the beginning, trying to figure out the right height and all this stuff, it was a struggle the first couple passes. But then we got into the later fuller season soybeans. We had 17 varieties here. And it really started working. And this, this was really interesting, doing this and kind of pushing the envelope, if you will, of how we could kind of bend the rules somewhat to, to maybe add some to our bottom line. <coughs> and I'll get into how I put this all together here as we go on. So after that, I wanted to start messing with other crops. And there's a lot of things we're going to do this year. But right here we have corn and soybeans together. So I call this a spectrum analysis plant. So we're, we normally plant our corn on 20 inch rows. I omitted 
grows, I started living plants, and I wanted to see how the relationships worked out. What was really interesting here, as we went from our normal 32, 34,000 corn plants, down to 17, down to 11, and down to five or 6,000 plants like you're seeing here, the relationship for how the corn plant grew and how it affected the soybean changed dramatically. It was pretty interesting. You know, we all want to try these things on our crop, on our farm at scale. And I, I'm in the in the belief that if we have this incubator mindset where we have a new idea and we want to try that experiment over 10 or 100 different ways, we can kind of learn several years worth of knowledge in one year and, and kind of take what you learn and kind of go on and scale for next year. We'll get into that here shortly as well. So I really love this picture. Our oil man that brings us fuel on the farm gave me this about three months ago, and it's been in the coffee shop for the last couple of years. This is in Monte, Indiana, close to my hometown, and this is a Chevy plant, 1957. <coughs> I've got four grandfathers here. This is the grandfather I still farm with, Jim. There's Papa Lou, great grandfather, great grandfather, and they were they just did a little farm tour. Uh, to check out the factory. And actually, my grandpa worked there for four or five years. He was buying new ground to kind of help out on that. <coughs> Talk a little bit about how our mindset has changed. In 1957, you know, we're about 40 years removed from Henry Ford really revolutionizing the auto industry, you know, inventing the uh, assembly line. They made a man's hands 10, 20 times more valuable. And in 1957, it was all about horsepower. This guy right here, in a few years from now, he had a 4520 and he took out that engine and he put a Detroit V8 in there. And everyone knew it was Louis Heaton because they could hear him from 10 miles away. But he could pull six bottoms in six gears. He was pretty proud of that. And that was very important in the 60s. It was all about efficiency. Right? Until 1968, no one knows him. So we started adding this technology, herbicides. We started doing all these different things. Now we got all these snake oil salesmen and all these things that we can do on our farm. We added another dimension, which was kind of urgency. You know, when you wake up in the morning, you don't know if you're going to plant corn or spray or scrape crop or whatever you're going to do. What's the most important thing we can do? So that's what we wake up. But what's kind of happened through the years, take my phone out. I, I, took, I gave my phone to Jonathan. But if you get your cell phone out, Think about all the technologies on your cell phone. How much was that camcorder that Bob Saget had in 1989 worth? I remember spending $1,200 or $1,300 for that. And that's one of maybe 40 things on that phone that was worth $1,000. So you would think that with all these technologies in our fingerprints, me just changing this with this little clicker, we would be so much more efficient. And we are, right? I mean, we are increasing our yield. But what's this next dimension? is significance. Significance is about reduction. Because we're, we're starting to feel now that no matter how much we produce, if we're spending just as much money, we're basically turning into a hamster that's running on a hamster wheel and juggling at the same time. But we're still in the same spot. So significance is, what can I do today that's going to buy me time tomorrow to be with my family or do something else to enrich my life? What can I do today to reduce? What can I do today to eliminate? What can I do today to figure out a way to automate and delegate jobs to nature so I don't have to do that next year to buy me time? I think significance in this idea of reduction is the only way we're really going to you know, have the rubber hit the road and, and buy time. That, I, mean, I think that's what it really comes down to. And also, I, I share this because I farmed with my grandpa. My dad left pain cancer in 2010. My other uncle, Louis, just passed away a couple of years ago. Both 53, both in their prime. I mean, I was playing basketball with my dad. Both physical specimens gone. So when that happens, if you and you, you've got farming in your blood, you start looking at life a little bit differently that, you know, we're all racing, we're all competing, but what if we start sharing our knowledge, sharing how we can get integrate systems to uh, maybe come up with something more significant. 
So again, this is what I really cherish is time with my boys. I got their, uh, this one will be four here in a few days. They're five years old, we like to go down the river and see nature. And he likes to look at predator prey relationships. And <laughs> we do all those cool things. And I think true happiness is, is being around nature. See how lucky I am there. So anyway, I've got a couple pictures from Google on here. This isn't my farm, but this is one thing that I want to do to really connect with the community and maybe eliminate some jobs. These are chicken tractors. And right now I have Tyler, my right hand man at home, making these exact chicken tractors. We want to put this in between our wide row corn, our wide row CP hemp, some other crops, and let those darn things eat the weeds for me and let those things distribute the manure. We put some bio shower down. I'm really excited about getting livestock in our fields in between the rows. So you gotta ask yourself this. You know, there's two ways to kind of have this innovative mindset. And one is to be really type A and technical and you go in a shop and you gotta figure out how to mechanically pull something off. And that's great. We need those kind of minds. I'm more of the guy that just shares an idea as soon as it comes and I'm going to do the one horsepower test right out of the gate. Take something simple that costs nothing and share it, figure out if it works, and start at a very incubator level. Now, most people would say that's very risky to be kind of have emotional risk, but honestly, it costs literally nothing, or maybe five or ten dollars. Now, it takes some thick skin. You're going to have some people really give you some some crap about being open with your mistakes, but I think that's one thing we need to look at. Is it more risky to share your ideas and do random things at a small scale and learn, or is it more risky to fight and say, it's all China's fault, or it's this trade war. It's something's fault, and we're competing with each other, and stay the exact same and defend what you do. I, I would argue now it's more risky to keep doing the same thing and, and just be a, a complainer. And I don't mean to be mean in any way that way. So, Liam loves to eat corn. He can really put her down. I think he's only year number three. Here he can put four or five down. We also have a lot of pigs. We've got 12,000 pigs at any time. Now, when we first started these farms, we went from sows to the confined feeding route in 1997. It was a great thing. We could raise better corn on our hogs. But what happened was we went from 2,000 to 4,000 to 8,000, to 12,000, and now we have 5 million gallons of manure, and we farm 3,000 acres, but only about 1,300 of them, we can get that manure to the field without putting it in a tanker. And our, we were talking, I was talking with Keith about rainfall. We're getting this crazy weather, so you can't just go out there with an 80,000 pound machine and dump the manure. So we've got a problem that I really want to address is we're raising all these cash crops commodities to feed animals, and then we completely forget about what we're going to do with all that waste. I think this is going to be a big opportunity. So that was part of the reason why I got into relay cropping as well, is figuring out how to kind of use these nutrients to our advantage. So this was our first year. Uh, another farmer named John Coots had been doing this for five or six years when I thought I'd try doing this relay cropping wheat 30 inch rows. And I had tremendous wheat, but the problem was when we look back at that relationship, there's no room here for the soybean. So I spent a lot of money on soybean seed, and I should have just made a pile of cash and caught it on fire and, and cooked a weenie with it or something, you know? It was a total waste of time. So that was a hard mistake. And so the next year, we did a couple things where we drag line manure, and this is our monocrop wheat. And these aren't wheat rows right here. This is kind of a crying picture right now. That's manure injection sites. So that changed my mindset for the next year. Uh, how can we capture this energy? And, and this wheat actually hurt its yield somewhat. It was making all these tillers, but the tillers couldn't open up to the, the, the light. Uh, so we had a lot of lodging issues on this field. Now right next to it, we went to 37 inch rows and added a cover crop. Now we did this the previous year and it looked fantastic. We just didn't make room for the soybean. So we took these 30 inch rows and widened that out 7.5 inches. 
Got a little crap for that, 37.5. How did we come up with that? It was just more room. And it, and it worked really well, again, on weak control. So the, again, this is kind of a screen pass mentality. Uh, Rick Beaver was talking about earlier about controlling weeds with herbicide. You know, what if we just let everything live and think ahead a little bit and kind of run that screen pass? So I know I have all this fertility in the, in the manure. If I get multiple plant species out here, these radishes are going to grow and absorb that ammonium, catch it, and release it to that wheat. We saw that wheat really green up early that year. And because this is a really low carbon to nitrogen ratio cover crop, we got our ground nice and warmed up for soybeans. Just another picture of that. So I'll get back to what we did after that. Talk a little bit about corn. So at the same time, we're doing kind of this offensive idea. Thought we could do the same thing on 60-inch corn uh, with the idea to graze cattle. So this is last summer. Uh, we went to an 86-day hybrid corn. So my thought process here was it's always finite. We only have so much water. How are we going to consume it and kind of let these plants grow together? So we hedged 20 days on the corn. This is 86-day corn. Put our pearl millet out here. And we let the pearl millet, by waiting to V6, that pearl millet would grow and really take over after the corn kind of done its deed. So it's got to pollinate, and that corn was in sweet corn stage before <coughs> this thing really took off. And it actually grew taller than the corn itself. And this is a little picture of harvest. So maybe it's not the best thing to do, harvest corn with a grain head, but it does work. I mean, it gets 90, 95% of it, basically. And those, those paddles just went out ahead of that reel and pushed us down. And now you have a string of spider mass. Now we're to 86 day. This is uh, September 1st. So there's plenty of time uh, to maybe get multiple growths and maybe seed something else after that kind of bus kills off. So again, Tyler, my right hand man, we've got a scrap pedal in, or a scrap pile in the shop. And I came up with this idea. We uh, took the shanks off the manure tanker, two of them, and made 60 inch shanks. And if it show up here, I don't know if it'll show up. We just added a gravity fed candy box and sprinkled wheat seeds over the top of that manure injection. There we go. So this idea right here evolves into kind of the next step of thinking how we can do this on a broader scale of getting carbon manure, the, the energy in manure in a location for that cereal to manipulate its plant architecture and kind of play out and replace the cost down the road. So my econ on here, and this might, might not completely agree with this, but you saw my soil test analysis. If my phosphorus is through the roof, farmers in this situation are always chasing nitrogen. So they want to get their nitrogen to usually grow corn. So they're applying all this phosphorus knowing that they're going to lose their nitrogen, and it's just making their problem even worse. So instead of paying a penny a gallon, I can do this for myself for maybe 12 or $15. I'm just sprinkling eight or ten dollars worth of wheat seed on there. So it's really kind of a net negative cost. And can we use this cover crop to replace job? Someone. Ah. There we go. So this is what that looks like later on. Again, we added oats and cover and uh tillage radishes, they got pretty good size out here. They died off being winter killed in late December, early January, and leave these little trips. And you see how thin that is. That was just 25 pounds a week. So uh, Grandpa would roll by there and shake his head and say, I just don't know what you're thinking there. But uh, I just said patience. We'll see what I'm, what I'm wanting to do there. OK, my, now my clicker. Next spring. So this 
is our commercial fertilizer. I'm going to start running around with it. You've got a commercial fertilizer right here, plant 1.6 million seeds, the right way to grow wheat, and then you got the manure injections right there. You see that color difference? So that nitrogen, ammonia, and sulfur was deposited right in that plant. The cover crops would grab whatever that, you know, small wheat couldn't capture, and then it would catch and release into that wheat. We saw the same thing the previous year, and it's really neat watching this wheat grow here. So I talk a lot about this phenomenon. I, it's called God's math or, or nature's code, this, this phi. So phi is an irrational number. And the sunflower through evolution has figured out that to pack the maximum amount of seeds on its head, it has to figure out this spiral. You see it in seashells, you see it in weather systems. Everything is designed with its growth in mind. And the reason why that's really important, when we start mul adding multiple entities, we've got to be figuring out the physiological dimensions, how much water they're consuming, and how they grow together. Because you can get too aggressive with this entity, and it negatively affects this entity more than you would gain with that. So that's been kind of the, as we figure out these experiments, how can we get multiple entities is letting seeds and plants express their genetic potential. <clears throat> so that first picture, there was a tree in the background. Just like if you're lost in the woods, there's going to be moss on the north side to find what direction is north. Plants grow exactly the same way. So phi, 1.618, if this is the north side, it's going to be slightly higher than the left side. Now, you look at this, is this 100% sun capture right here? 100% linear. If I drive across I-70, you're more like I-80, dead flat, 100%, AB. But how much further is it if I get on the St. Louis Arch and walk over the south side? So if we compromise a little bit, we can get similar surface heads and wider rows and express genetic expression and get more production per seed. But more importantly than that, I made an opportunity for another plant to be in a different life cycle. So when this wheat is dying, it's, it's not photosynthesizing anymore at nearly the rate. It's, it's in just simply drying that grain down. So the last 15, 10, 15 days of wheat, you're drying wheat down at my latitude on our most productive days. If we have 13 and a half, 14, 14 and a half day, hour days, we could have another entity growing in the same space. So you just see with our wheat, we can grow the same shape. And you see these little soybeans right here, growing in a little microclimate to make them grow a little bit better. And this is a few days later. And then there. So this guy is the end of his life cycle. This guy is like your, like you right here. How old are you, 14? 18, sorry. <laughs> you probably can really put down some hamburgers and cereal and all kinds of food and they don't know how you, they feed you. This, this, these soybeans are in juvenile growth stage, so they're growing at a rapid rate. And they'll actually, if you let that play out, like the previous two years ago, it will actually eat the lungs of the wheat if you give it enough time. So that's how we maximize that energy into the soil with maximizing photosynthesis. So does anyone in here play golf or enjoy it? A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I like to play. I, I, it's just an excuse to really get out of the house and drink some beer. Uh, so I put a little course at my house. And maybe the worst thing in the world is watching golf. Now I can watch Tiger Woods a little bit, but watching golf is just, it's not fun at all. So do a little experiment here. Can I get, if you were at a golf course, you know, I have that piddly golf clap. Can I get a little golf clap from you guys? Terrible. <laughs> yeah. All right, double your golf clap. And then double that. Double, 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 double. Yeah. That's what a plant feels when it can capture more sun per plant. When we start widening the rows, when we start thinking about solar corridor, we change the physiological, you know, the, the dimensions and the, the the opportunity or potential of every seed. And 
that's the C that we got to, you know, that's, that's a cost. So that field earlier where you had the really dark green wheat and then the high, right, this is 1.6 million seeds. You're going to have one wheat head right there on top. You're going to maybe have a half wheat. I call this Duggar wheat. 19 kids and counting. Have you seen that? So we've got 19 tillers that react to that space, and now each one of these can produce a grain head. So there's probably an agronomist in the back saying, this is so wrong, you're never going to maximize profit, or not profit, yield. And I know, I, I know, I, I really don't care. I want to, to do the job. These little minions right here should be the MVP, because these guys, when I get 12 inches of rain in May, it doesn't matter if my planter costs $1.7 million, and I have a perfect down pressure, and it was, it was it was blessed as I put it in the ground. If it rains four inches, it's not going to have oxygen to survive. These guys right here, every three bushels <coughs> that I grow eliminate one acre inch of water. So I can be consuming water, I can be making roots, and I can develop contribution margin with these weeds. So contribution margin is this new thought process where maybe you have multiple crops, you have chicken tractors, you have all these entities on the same acre, and what's relevant is the difference in variable cost. So if I have a variable cost of say $50 producing this, and it makes 30, and I get $180, that's contribution margin that goes towards adding of whatever the next crop produces. So can we look at the other side of the ledger and say, now I don't have to spray herbicide on a portion of the ground floor, so let's take that off, now that my soybeans kept all the root hairs and had oxygen and grow better, I've increased yield. So you can add and subtract on both sides of the ledger, and that's what gets really interesting on here, and that's why I get really excited about it. A little close up. You do the same thing with the other side. <coughs> so that soybean, at the same time, is figuring out its environment. And if we can make it produce branches, they'll, later <coughs> on in their life, produce more more grain per seed. So this is a little experiment this summer. You saw the video earlier. I want to share the story of why I started doing this. Two stories, actually. So the first story, I wanted to see a corn's genetic ability. So three years ago, my five-year-old was potty trained. And, and naturally, when you want to potty train, you want to do it in the summer because they can just pee anywhere. They can be in their underwear. And if that goes bad, it's not a big deal, right? So we took a corn plant after it emerged and we gave it plenty of space, about six or seven feet on all directions. And I told Liam, here's your target. Start peeing on that, buddy. And he did. And the plant recognized this fertility and sunshine and it made two plants. I'm sorry, two more crop uh, suckers, if you will. Now, as we went through time, every node started to look like it was growing corn on every node, which was eventually going to be an ear. And it started to uh, make ears, and I got on Twitter, and I think, I was saying, you know, I think this thing will make 10 or 15 ears. It's pretty incredible. Now, what happened over the next six weeks is that corn plant recognized how awesome life was, right? He was saying, I have all this sunshine. I've got this little two-year-old taking a leak on me every night. I think I can put more babies in a minivan. So every ear would come out and start growing leaves on the ears. And you'll see this as you start lowering your population. You'll start getting these leaves on your ears that will bring more energy back locally in that plant. So in six weeks, it went from these little corn ears to grow 31 ears on that one corn plant. So how can we do that on a field scale? We're not going to be able to grow 31 ears because there's only so much daddy's love in the go around. I only had about 10 years with uh, total kernels on there, about five or 10 with spotty, and the rest were silk down on the base. Can we go for three, four, five years per plant? So in our little experiment here, we started taking rows out, we put little gaps in here, and we were triggering multiple years on these edge plants. We made every plant an edge plant. And the whole point is, is this. Now, we had the nitrogen, obviously, with that 31 year plant. But as we lower our population, the plant grabs more 
Free energy via sunlight doesn't require as much nitrogen. We're not pushing the envelope on production. That plant is getting not the golf clap, it's getting the big clap. And we can exponentially increase plant production. But at the same time, we can start using this crop. You see my shadow right here? So imagine the sun is out on a sunny day, and it changes throughout the, the sky through the course of the day. We can, we can change the shadow to the soybeans as the sun changes position. So those soybeans, when it's 95 degrees, yes, the corn is grabbing all that sunlight, but the soybeans are getting a slight cool down. And I got that uh, idea from a man named James Bates. He was a plant breeder in uh, Hawaii. He was seeing this heat stress in plants. And he started doing this thing, he called it 100-100 Club, so I wanted to try it on my farm. It's pretty interesting having two entities and maybe using one as kind of a cooling effect for the other. But as far as math, and I'll get past this page, if I plant four or 5,000 corn seeds instead of 32,000, so four would be one eighth, say my normal seed is $100 an acre, it's $12.5 an acre, if I can localize my nitrogen via maybe astronaut food, where we put a coating on that seed with biochar or something like that, or we use a liquid effluent that's locally in that place, we can get this nitrogen down to maybe 20 or 30 pounds. So we can cut that variable cost for corn production down here instead of whatever it is now. And we don't need a ton, a ton of yield to contribute, especially if we don't hurt our soybean yield. Or maybe we hurt it slightly, but our contribution margin is, is greater. And I know this may give you an aneurysm, and you're wondering how you pull that off. We can separate it, but the math is there. It's pretty interesting when we start messing with the variables. And this is what I really see in my wheat and soybeans. I do a lot of chalk talks. And this is kind of my pie curve. And what I'm doing with this curve here is explaining that with wheat, as we really cut population, widen the rows, just the, the Additional yield that we get for each seed, if you will, is going to be extremely elastic right off the bat. If I drop one seed here, one seed here, one seed here, so we'll put 70 or 100 wheat heads per seed. And, and this is an extremely elastic relationship. But in, in, uh, in modern ag, we're all right out here on the curve. See my little laser? That is the land of diminishing returns. That's that snake oil salesman saying, use this product, it costs $12 an acre, I guarantee you'll gain 3.7 bushels and you're thinking, uh, you know, that's just one more trip across the field, whatever it is. Back here, it's really interesting because we don't get real greedy with our sun capture. If we leave a little left, light left for another entity to be, to be in juvenile state while this is in, you know, dying state, now we can find this relationship where maybe it's a good thing to consume a little bit of water, maybe it's a good thing for its death to lay down and be a corpse that cools the ground and instead of a consumer now it's a preserver of moisture. That's what's really neat as we add these multiple entities is maybe this other entity does slightly better with the big brother. So if you are 13, 14 years old and you're you know, five foot tall, you're worried about being bullied on when you go into high school, it's really nice to have that big brother and say don't mess with them. And as we get crazy weather, as we get all these things, I think there's a lot of interesting things we can do with multiple crops. That's your job. So I just showed the ear flex here. You got three different ways it can flex. You can add ears, you can make a longer ear, and you make more depth. And the more that you give it more life, you'll see all three of them happen. And ran those two crops together with the 9600. So, a guy in Minnesota, old spiral separation has been out for years and years, but he's got a little modular design that doesn't cost much, and you can use the attributes of the two different crops. This thing will gain momentum in a spiral and spit out the corn, more friction, it'll stay close, and you get a sub 2 3% one uh, go around through the spiral separator. Done studies of 20, 40 inch corn, and I really think the future, even pushing yields, is going to be in wider row corn. And maybe we need to go twin rows. We don't need 20 inches apart from the, from the plant, but things really interesting as we start bathing 
things, getting our solar corridor wider to maybe have another cash crop, but more likely grow your nitrogen through some kind of legume and have more energy for that to, to pump more of that into the ground for the next crop. And you've got a lot of carbon right here, we can move that. You know, if you've got a lot of carbon residue right here, move that to the side. That should help you tie up a little bit. There's a little look at our setup. So we've got a little bit bigger head this year, 22 foot. And a funny story there's Tyler, that's the guy that I, I did my project to, that's working the chicken tractors. He said, Jason, because we got this on a tractor house for I think $5,000, just a piece of crap head, but it did the deed for this year. He said, if this was a racehorse, uh, we call it job security. And uh, <laughs> you can see it kind of shook apart, but with plenty of self tapping screws, we got her done. Front. And again, you saw that same outfit harvest the pearl millet. These project out far enough to get out ahead of the reel, and you can pretty much pull off anything uh, with that system. Well, what we're going to do next year that I'm really excited about is go to a stripper header that has a completely different uh, mechanism and pulls off the, you know, the tops, and I think we can get much more ground speed and put a little a crimper there on the bottom, sorry, right here where the wheat was, and crimp that down to drive light down lower, push that residue down. And I get really excited about pruning. So this was one thing you could do as a landscaper. Uh, a plant would get old and ragged, and it would start having dead biomass in there. So if you would just cut that out, the plant would drive light lower, and it would just become healthier. And I talk about these two different growth stages with the cereal and a soybean, first, a little tangent, when we plant the soybeans, we can let wheat take care of weed control right here. Is there really a point in laying herbicide in that space if we've got a good stand? No, so we can take that off. But this play right here, of pinning that residue down, goes from that golf clap to that standing ovation for the plant like this. And soybeans are a short day crop, so they are constantly recognizing length of day, and they'll, they'll, they'll mature as, no matter if you plant in June or April, you know, as a certain point. So I think there's a little trick here. We're getting increased yield on our full, full, full season soybeans. That plant, through this pruning mechanism, is getting three to five times more light at R2 in an instant. So that plant has lost its motive to vegetatively compete with its brothers. So it can stand in place and grow horizontally, and you'll see it as you pull these plants compared to mono crops, the nodes start compressing, and you can just change the physical, physiological uh, you know, attributes of that plant. And these plants right here were 100 bushel soybeans that year, when it was going to be a disaster, right? That's three days afterwards. It doesn't take very long for all that residue to push down pop up and you know you've got these little uh, solar corridors with the thatch so your ground's not as hot but also uh, you know maybe you get a little airflow in there you don't have that dew on those soybeans as long so maybe we can get away from some of our fungal pressure there. So it's really interesting with these plants when we start thinking about uh, this plant production you kind of turn into this 401k in your plants. This goes back to that golden ratio. You've got your one, and you've got your 6.18. And as you play the math out here, it, it starts multiplying in all these different directions, and it will fill in all this space. So if you look at a tree, it'll grow like that, and that's how we get this increased production per plant. So Jonathan's here in the audience. We do a lot of these whiteboard talks uh, chalkboard, you know, get your ideas on something, write them down. And if you don't want to get on social media, at least tell your wife about it, your friend. But the more that you can do this freely, and then actually maybe take a picture of your daily thought, put, put that out there, express it, do it, and uh, it's pretty interesting what can uh, work out. So we're working on a project right now. When you go back to that manure situation, we've got copious amounts of waste going into not only the atmosphere, but our soil and our water. 
and working on a project, working with about 50 local farmers, uh, where we take a portion of their manure and make renewable natural gas. Uh, if you follow me on social media, you saw me drink manure a couple weeks ago. Um, we uh, separate the nutrients from potable water, and then we will take the phosphorus and gasify that down to biochar. And uh, pretty excited about this project. Working on, when we looked at that manure strip seeder thing, how can we scale that up? If we can take these nutrients and get that liquid nitrogen and potassium, uh, we can start banding that organic fertilizer in that space. Uh, this fall, I mixed biochar with our seed and some commercial fertilizer and, and placed that underneath the wheat plants themselves. And the idea here, there's uh, two duo seeds up front with a pluribus. So we do do some tillage to get that biochar and clean that residue out of the way. But we're making the zero spaced cereal and then use the same machine coming back in the spring and hood spray over the soybean. So we'll have a little hood spray we devise and then only spray that space. The whole idea here is, you know, we could add units, we can go wider. This can be pulled very fast. Our variable costs are, are pretty cheap. And can we add contribution margin, reduce cost, and get some of these attributes that I had talked about? One more thing, if you are looking for an excuse to take a little road trip, we're having a field day. This is this past year's field day, June 26th this year. And we go out in the field and look at our experiments. We're working on a lot more experiments this year, not only the relay stuff, the chicken tractors, we'll have CB hemp, we've got some organic acres. Uh, there's probably a lot of ideas that I still haven't even thought of that we're gonna do. And uh, we'll share that. We'll have uh, rabbit tractors there with autonomous vehicles, maybe some other speakers. And then we all just cracked open some barley pops and listen to some rock and roll. These guys are flying buffaloes so up from Nashville. Pretty fun. So I invite all you guys to come up. And I don't know whether my final slide is, but I just want to leave you with this. There are no answers. You know, we just got to start experimenting and figuring out how we can have more time with our family. I think that's what it really all comes down to. So that's what's really my motivation and drive. Um, went through several years coming back to the family farm, making multiple trips across the field. And when you start getting done with a task, and you know that you've got to get in another vehicle and do another task, and you can't hang out with you know, take your kids to the coffee shop and, and eat a donut with them or, or tuck them into bed. I think this is, I'm not trying to be mean here, but I think that's a form of selfishness. I mean, when I'm working and I'm out with my family, I, I feel selfish. And I just want to <laughs> encourage everyone. I know we've got to work to, to make a living, but, but I'm just begging and telling you, 